So welcome everyone uh, to today's panel discussion organized by the ÖFG Working Group on Peaceful Change. Uh, title for today is Major Powers and the Future of the Liberal World Order. And uh, there are all kinds of debates and discussions about this now. So is the order going to break? Is it going to be resilient? Uh, and oftentimes when we look at these debates, uh, be it in the media, uh, be it in scholarly journals, um, oftentimes there is a lot of attention being paid to great powers. And there's probably a very good reason for that, because uh, if we look at uh, international orders in the past, then their fate usually has quite a bit to do with what great powers do. And uh, so therefore, I'm very happy to have uh, three very distinguished speakers for today's panel. They're all part of our OFG network on peaceful change. I'm gonna introduce him, them to you only very, very briefly. So I'm not gonna do justice to their excellence uh, in a way. And I do that very briefly because I want to have enough time for discussion later on. Um, uh, so we have Professor Heinisch from the University of Salzburg. Uh, he's going to tell us something about the United States. We have Professor Gerhard Mangot from the University of Innsbruck. Uh, he has great expertise on Russia. And then we have Professor Susanne Weigelin Schwitzek from the University of Vienna, and her expertise is on China. And um, we can uh, later on then perhaps in a discussion uh, also uh, talk about whether that selection was accurate. The selection was, was mine. So if I have made any mistakes and omissions there with these three great powers and we can discuss that uh, as well. Uh, but I think for uh, tonight's discussion, it's gonna work out very well. Um, the speakers are gonna talk for about 10 minutes and uh, so actually very, very brief. Um, so necessarily it's going to be a bird's eye view um, and then after that we're going to enter into our discussion and uh, as usual uh, some of you you listen now in via zoom some of you via facebook if it's via facebook uh, then uh, please write your comments uh, they're going to be transferred now uh, onto my zoom account i can see it in the chat function i can read it then to the speakers and, uh, and for those of us who attend on Zoom, you can actually ask your questions by then raising uh, your hand. Uh, so without any further ado, um, we're gonna go into the order in which I introduce the speakers. Um, so Professor Heinisch, Reinhardt, uh, you're gonna go first and that is gonna be on the United States. All right, um, hope you can all understand me. Um, I'm going to give you a perspective perhaps on the current state of the view of the world seen from um, the, an American domestic perspective. I think I'd like to set this up like that and then we could talk about the implications and the consequences of the kinds of changes we're seeing um, in, in the US. Now, since um, George Washington's farewell address, the US has been for much of its existence an isolationist power. This may be hard to believe because of the US's global alliance system, because of its mammoth reach and its seemingly endless foreign wars. Yet the US isolation impulses are deeply sewn into the fabric of its society. And thus every major conflict, after every major conflict, the US sort of always lurched back into isolationism. Even Initially, after the end of World War II, um, was no exception. And only the threat posed by the Soviet Union actually brought the US um, uh, out of this isolationism and brought about a reorientation towards international engagement. And after the Cold War, this was no different. The US again began drifting into that direction until 9-11 sort of changed its trajectory again. The reality is that for most Americans, the world just doesn't matter to their personal lives, or it doesn't matter enough to expend great resources on foreign operations. Notwithstanding Article 5 in NATO, the idea that America's sons and daughters should die for Estonia, Latvia, or Taiwan, places, places that, that many people frankly could not find on a map, is extremely unpopular among ordinary citizens. 
yes, if the country is threatened or attacked, or if suddenly there would be um, not enough gasoline or some humanitarian tragedy were to unfold perpetrated by some rogue regime, a majority of Americans may feel the country is compelled to act and would also act militarily. Here too, the problem is that most Americans have no good grasp of the real power and size of the US military in relation to American competitors and what the American military is actually designed for. As culturally diverse as the US is, as remote it feels in many parts with respect to the rest of the world. Teaching in a rural and small town Appalachian hinterland, depressed by 20 years of decline of the coal and steel industry due to globalization, I started my academic career deep in Trump country long before there was Donald Trump. For the people, for most of my students, for most of the, their parents and their families um, in, in that area, but in much of the Midwest and South, New York City is another planet. London, Tokyo, Beijing are other galaxies. US foreign policy, its doctrines, its global engagements, its fine think tanks all emanate from, very, from a very small bubble of mostly uh, prestigious East Coast institutions. The US foreign policy establishment is very impressive, uh, is very well trained, is extremely knowledgeable. I worked for a period for the State Department. And however, it is also isolated from the rest of the population. However, for a long time, it didn't really matter what ordinary Americans thought about foreign policy or foreign policy doctrines or the world order. The US did not conduct foreign policy and security policy based on polling and popularity. Had that been the case, the US's most important ally would have been Ireland. In, 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 in times past, both major parties may have oscillated between realism and liberal internationalism, but it nonetheless shared a commitment to a global role of the US a management of world affairs to global institutions in which the US had the preponderance of power and the willingness to support the institutions and arrangements for US resources and muscle. Even when the US was no longer willing or able to play this role to the fullest extent a period that the academics call post hegemony, the US was still indispensable and could credibly make a difference in the outcome. In this, it remained quintessential and above all predictable. The security architecture that makes up a significant part of the world order today still depends on US commitments and reciprocal arrangements that have never been fully tested and are not understood by most American voters. They are increasingly less understood by American politicians as the old senators leave and as the parties are undergoing massive change. Often they are replaced, these senators, by those that represent a new kind of anti-establishment and anti-institutionalist orientation. What struck me personally about the removal of Liz Cheney from her leadership position last week was not so much a recognition of how out of step she was with her party, but the, that she was widely labeled a globalist and attacked by the right-wing media. American credibility is the linchpin of the current international world order, most importantly, American security guarantees for its allies in Asia and Europe. While it is true that deep down the US may have long abandoned the idea of defending all allies in the face of a determined attack by a major foe, where the alternatives are only full mobilization or the use of nuclear weapons, the US and the world was contented thus far to pretend at least that the US would defend its allies and would act forcefully. I, every summer I teach at Renmin University in Beijing and uh, I have a colleague at Renmin who uh, always tells me that um, the Chinese government when it was still focused primarily on economic development was quite happy about the American troops in stationed in South Korea and in Japan, even if these troops were fig leaf, because it helped curb the appetite, it allowed the government to help curb the appetite of Chinese nationalist segments in the party and the population. All these conditions have changed or are changing. 
the most significant change in American politics is the current transformation of the party system in which Biden represents an aberration and a throwback to a previous era. The Republican Party has become the party of Trump. Its establishment figures are being dismantled and replaced by people whose instincts are nationalist and isolationist. They and their voter base are hostile to expensive foreign commitments, disparaging of allies and institutions, and ignorant of the complexities, interdependencies of the current system. There's a, a zero sum understanding of foreign relations, a focus on short term and temporary alliances with pliable and uncomplicated allies. Foreign policy is subservient to domestic power games. They're also subservient to economic interests, but not so much as in the past of American enterprise in general, but rather of networks close to the leadership. Yet the overall orientation is illiberal, protectionist, and nationalist. Currently, this view is still a minority in the Senate, and its uh, ties and dependence to US business have sort of always ensured a more globalist and institutionist outlook, but every new election brings about change that weakens um, the international, internationalist segment of the party. Also in the Democratic Party, there's a, there are strong currents such as Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, who, who quite forcefully question U.S. overseas commitments and are especially critical of the U.S. military expenditures in favor of a reorientation towards domestic needs, economic protectionism, and there is, they see little need for the U.S. to defend rich allies. Democratic voters are even more critical and more vocal of, US's, of the U.S.'s role abroad than their elected officials. As a result, the foreign policy establishment either engages in stealth to do many of its operations, hoping ordinary citizen, citizens won't notice, or they depend on the threat or enemy, and the threat or an enemy that sufficient that sufficiently resonates with the average voters to justify expensive U.S. foreign commitments. Russia no longer serves this function. It is not seen as a peer or real rival. It may threaten the Europeans, and it has a, a nuclear arsenal and formidable weapons, but it is by itself not a global challenger. This makes the US presence in Europe and NATO, NATO in general, in the eyes of many Americans, an expensive anachronism and limits the value of European allies, especially those European allies, unlike Britain, who are not willing to follow the US to where it sees the future area of conflict, namely East Asia. China is the major rival and perceived not only as a peer, but as potentially superior. Although China still lacks the soft power the US has, its appeal goes far beyond its size of military. If you want to see a third world airport, land at Kennedy. If you want to see a tragic transportation infrastructure story, ride the US fast train a cellar. If you want to see failing schools, visit the, any of the inner city schools in many US cities. If you want to see the opposite, go to China. In short, the rise of China dovetails the America in decline narrative, which resonates with both Republicans and Democrats, but they draw different conclusions. For the right, China represents an identitarian and cultural challenge, a challenge by a non-Judeo-Christian culture that is seeking to transplace the US and relegate it to second power status, thereby threatening US economic interests in the long run. Foreign policy and military resources spent elsewhere will be increasingly hard to justify. Here, a military confrontation, confrontation is often seen as inevitable. For the left, China represents a political challenge, an Orwellian type of state capitalism that threatens liberal democracy in many places. There, the military confrontation is less inevitable, but the focus lies on regime competition, meaning that the needs that the United States needs to bring its own house in order and divest from the military and transfer the resources into its uh, domestic commitments. Finally, and I'm concluding with this, what makes the current world order so precarious is the willingness of all parties concerned to test the existing commitments and if you will, call the American bluff. This is not only the policy direction coming from America's antagonists, but increasingly also from within the US but the growing interest to challenge and tear down the existing order, it is, it is that looks more likely with every elections. This, this means for Europeans, and I'm paraphrasing Macron here, Europeans really need to think whether they want their security 
dependent on a few thousand voters in Indiana or Pennsylvania. Thank you very much. Anna, thank you very much for a brilliant, very, very concise talk. So exactly 10 minutes and, and full with uh, information. And uh, I'm going gonna, gonna to move now, uh, staying in the West, actually, moving a little bit south to the University of Innsbruck. And I'm going to give the words to Professor Mangot, who is going to talk on Russia. Yeah. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you for the invitation to take part in this panel. Good evening to all those who see us, who listen to us. Well, I'm glad that we are talking about Russia as well, because whether Russia is a great power is contested in the academic literature. Some see it just as a spoiler power or a disruptive power, but not a great power able to influence uh, the development of the international order. And there's also no consensus um, among the Russia research community whether Russia should be considered an imperialist power like Tsarist Russia uh, had been, like the Soviet Union had been, whether it is a status quo power defending its final assets as a great power, or whether it is a revisionist power aiming to change the international order, at least to trigger part changes of the international order. I myself consider Russia as a revisionist power, not as an imperialist one and not as a status quo power. And I want to make two propositions to underline my understanding about the international role of Russia. As I said, Russia is a revisionist power with deep grievances about its role and the role attribution for Russia in the international system. It is beset with deep grievances as, his, as its status and its, its prestige is concerned, and as well as the acceptance of its core interests by other great powers in the international system are concerned. Russia, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, was no longer being treated, was no longer treated and respected as a great power. This is a very strong and emotional part of Russia's narrative about the past 30 years. The second proposition is that Russia's revisionist Revisionism is reactive, as I see it, as it is not just according to the Russian narrative, but also to my, according to my analysis, the consequence of its deliberate marginalization in the international order by Western powers over the past 25 years. Russia deplores that in the face of its structural weakness, political, military, financial, and economic in the 1990s, it was deliberately pushed to the sidelines by the West. It has been treated as a rule taker and not as a rule maker. It was expected to follow when it wanted to lead as an equal partner, however illusionary this was in the early years of post-Soviet Russian foreign policy. Well, when we talk about Russia as a revisionist power, we need to define what revisionism actually means. And I, in my research, often use the typology of Randall Schweller, uh, outlined in a paper in 2015, where he argues, and I fully agree with him, that Russia is a limited aims revisionist power, not a revolutionary power. Revolutionary powers want to uh, bring down the, the existing international order and replace it with an order of their own. Russia is not able to, and it is not eager to abandon the current international order and impose one of its own. Russia indeed endorses salient parts of the current order, like the UN, financial institutions like the World Bank or the International Monetary Fund, the OECD, arms control and non-proliferation non regimes to mention just a few of them. But it wishes to change some of its elements and uh, wants to change its institutions, norms and rules. So again, I want to stress, Russia is not a revolutionary power, but as what Schweller calls a limited aims revisionist power. So a power that wants to stay in the existing order, but transform it to a certain extent. Rules, norms and institutions are aims of Russia as a revisionist power. 
uh, territory is it sometimes. However, I consider Crimea as the uh, exception, not as the rule of Russian foreign policy. I expect uh, further transgressions uh, to be unlikely. What also characterizes Russia as a revisionist power is that it is risk prone. And it, it has in, uh, increased the risk in its foreign policy, in its more and more aggressive foreign policy, the more it sees the West in decline, which started already with the global financial and economic crisis in 2008 and the relative decline of the United States, not vis-a-vis -vis Russia, but vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the People's Republic of China. And uh, a fourth and last element of this re uh, revisionist character of Russia is the fact that Russia is, is open to and willing to use violent instruments, violent means, if it considers it necessary to defend its vital interests. So what are the vital interests of Russia in the international system, in the current international order? It wants to defend its territorial integrity and the regime security. It wants to maintain Russia's sovereignty, understood as the ability to make decisions independent of other great powers, both externally and internally. It has a very, uh, a very traditional understanding of state sovereignty and uh, like China, rejects the interference in the domestic affairs of uh, the major powers. It is willing to defend its, what it sees as its historical entitlement to the status as a great power. And it insists on a, on a, a droit de regard in its neighborhood and thus opposes the institutional expansion of Western organizations like NATO and the European Union to its Western and Southern borders. In order to achieve these objectives in the international system, Russia first and foremost relies on power of coercion, military coercion, partly economic coercion. But it is weak as a power of persuasion and attraction. How does Russia see its core interests that I have defined uh, right before uh, as uh, challenged and threatened? Well, um, the Russian Federation, and this is not just Vladimir Putin, but the whole security and military establishment of the Russian Feder Federation, um, claim their right to ask for changes in international order by the fact that unlike the West had promised in the 1990s, no cooperative security architecture was established in Europe and on the globe. It instead criticizes, has criticized and will criticize the US drive for liberal hegemony uh, that started after the collapse of the bipolar international system. It regarded and regards neoconservative or liberal interventionism and the social engineering aspect of this interventionism uh, that had started already in the 1990s and continued uh, except for the Trump administration till today. It sees its interests challenged by the Western readiness to violate fundamental norms of international law. They are citing the Kosovo experience, the Iraq experience, the Libyan experience. And the Russians see its vital, sees its vital interests threatened by the expansion of Western military and political institutions like NATO and the European Union, while excluding Russia from these institutions. So the overall objective of Russia is to transform the hegemonial character of the liberal international order, which, it's, which it considers as a Western order, or to be more precise, a US in, imposed order and wants to transform it into a multipolar, or as the Russians say for a while already, into a polycentrist order. Uh, the major expectation and uh, interest of Russia in a, a changed, revised international order is to re-establish at best a balance of power um, constellation like in the 19th century, or at least, uh, uh, sorry, uh, it, it intends to, uh, to reinstall a concert of great powers at its best like in the 19th century, 
and in the worst case, it at least wants to re-establish a balance of power in the international system. Finally, how should we deal with such a, uh, a revisionist Russia? Well, that depends how we interpret Russian revisionism. Is Russia's revisionism and its challenge to the current international order the result of a country feeling insecure and marginalized? Or is the revisionism the result of a country that is intrinsically expansionist to some researchers, not too few of them, think? That means it depends on whether we see Russia, Russia's revisionist posture as reactive or proactive. If you think Russia is intrinsically expansionist, then the only thing uh, the United States and its Western allies can, can do is to pursue policies of containment and deterrence. If you see Russia's revisionism, however, as the result of insecurity, uh, then I would suggest to follow a policy of accommodation, recognize some of the Russian vital interests and bringing them into uh, harmony with vital Western interests. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so another 10 minutes uh, packed full with information. And uh, now we're gonna move from the West of Austria to uh, the East, we're gonna move to Vienna. And, uh, and with it also to uh, the panel, uh, to, to, the, to the discussion on China. Uh, Professor Weigelin Schlitzig, Susanne, you have the word. Yes, thank you very, very much. I try to uh, catch your attention uh, by uh, giving you a little bit of support by a PowerPoint presentation, which I prepared for my short um, arguments, which I'm going to present today. I hope everybody can see my PowerPoint presentation. and. Um, as I'm a historian focused on contemporary history and a political scientist, I'm sort of looking back into the past in order to understand what is going to happen or might be happening in the future. And as um, Markus told us, you know, we are talking about the future of our world order. I'm looking back, uh, as a matter of fact, at the Cold War constellation as my point of departure. And um, I'm beginning with my argument with the year 1971. Um, the year 1971 is from a Chinese perspective, and I think it's even more than that, it is the beginning of the end of the Cold War. And it, it, because it is the year in which the People's Republic of China uh, took over the right to represent the Chinese people in the United Nations and in the United Nations Security Council from the Republic of China on Taiwan, which had held this right since the founding of the United Nations. So this is the moment when China, the People's Republic of China, re-entered the world. Very interestingly, after a period of being marginalized and of self-marginalizing, which started with the Sino-Soviet rift in the early 1960s and uh, reached uh, um, its high point in the, in the period of the Cultural Revolution from 1966 to at least 1969. And in 1971, China re-enters the world and by being the representative of the Chinese people in the United Nations, it then uh, establishes diplomatic relations with countries all over the world, which had previously recognized the Republic of China on Taiwan as the only legitimate representative of the Chinese people. And many, many countries are eager actually to travel to China to, to shake hands with Mr. Mao, who at that time was already nearly incapable of speaking, of talking because of his uh, illness. And the reason why everybody wants to go to China, of course, is for those countries in the West, which are uh, allies of the United States, the fact that the US government is actually uh, sort of organizing its rapprochement with uh, China by ping pong diplomacy. This is what we called it at the time. Um, and uh, this implies that um, this um, re-entering of China into the international order 
uh, sort of came by because of a decision of the majority of the uh, membership countries of the UN, which was not totally planned by the US, but on the other hand, I think Mr. Kissinger had already realized that there was no end to the Vietnam War without um, uh, rapprochement with China, and this is what they decided in 1971, and you know that then uh, Kissinger and also Nixon went to China. So the interesting thing about the year 1971 is that we actually changed from a bipolar Cold War order into a triangular order. And this is, I think, an extremely interesting um, case in point, which might be very, very interesting also for us assessing, for example, the role of Russia today. Because at the time, China was extremely poor. It was militarily weak. It was a chaos inside. People in China uh, didn't even have enough to eat at the time. But nevertheless, it was recognized by the two superpowers, the Soviet Union and the US, as a third actor in the game of international relations. So it was not China's power that it had maybe built up during the years, but it was the fact that the two powers actually needed a third player, a third actor, that they introduced China into the game. And I think this actually added um, yet another factor of deterrence to the Cold War. Because in the uh, triangular game, the two traditional actors suddenly both strived for collaboration with China because they both feared that, for example, if the US sided with China, that would be very negative for Russia or vice versa. If Russia sided with, uh, with China, that would be very, very difficult for, for the US to handle. So the triangular situation actually made China into a country which had a major impact on the international development, although at the time, objectively speaking, it was a speaker, it was not a major power. And very interestingly, at the beginning, also because of internal ideological debates, uh, the PRC did not immediately go with the US. But at the beginning, they sort of um, sort of try to be good both with the Soviet Union and with the US and sometimes with the Soviet Union, sometimes with the US. But when it eventually sided with uh, the US, I would argue that this was the first step which eventually led to the end of the Soviet Union. And especially to the end of the Soviet Union as an actor in the system of international relations, which could claim equality with the US. I think the leadership in, 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 in China is trying to hide away from this issue, but I think from a third actor's perspective, this, is, um, this needs to be said. So uh, what I wanted to say is that, interestingly, with the entrance of China in the world, the binary setting of the Cold War was overcome by introducing a third actor into the system. And uh, I think this is something we should definitely have in mind when talking about the future. So what, as we just heard, with the end of the Cold War, um, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the PRC decided to submit to the hegemony of the US. And only because the um, China decided to accept the unipolar system that we have had ever since, has this system actually been able to come into being and be in existence ever since. So at the beginning, when China decided to open up and focus on its uh, economic development, uh, it had a, a foreign policy of what they call low profile. And this low profile foreign policy was actually focused on the need to be supported worldwide by its endeavor of economic development. And whenever you talk to, to, to leading people in China, they would explain to you that China needed a peaceful setting for the country to develop and to become um, economically uh, a power that can feed its people. And while this was going on, 
And while China was obviously submitting to this unipolar system, it actually developed a theory of international relations, which is a theory of a multipolar system. And it actually called for a sort of reshaping of the system of international relations with Europe, Russia, Japan, and the US playing a major role, but also the so-called BRICS countries becoming more and more important in a polycentric or how you say in, in Chinese, you say multi multipolar world. So as a matter of fact, they, they were compliant with the US order but at the same time, they were kind of trying out an alternative, a future that would be different. However, uh, when China started developing its economy and its military to a point that um, it already can view itself as um, second in this world, um, it started rearranging its theory of international relations and it now sort of propagates um, uh, no longer uh, a multipolar system, but actually strives for sharing responsibility for the world order with the US, which implies that actually China is going back to the idea of a bipolar system, the way we used to have a bipolar system during the Cold War era. And if we look at the US from a Chinese point of view, um, I think uh, the US and China are actually doing the same thing only from two different ends of the bipolar system because the US is building alliances to contain China worldwide and to sort of build an anti-China block or anti-China camp and uh, thus sort of uh, initiate a new Cold War system, which actually the Chinese side also wants to initiate because it doesn't want to share its resp responsibility for the world order with all kinds of poles around the world as it did in the past, but it now claims that it is actually strong enough to meet the US inequality and uh, to actually share with the US uh, the responsibility for a peaceful development of the international order. So which role does Russia play in this situation? I think very interestingly, Russia can play a similar role to China back in the 1970s. So when China was actually marginalized in the system of international relations, when China was weaker than the big powers at the time, than the Soviet Union and, and the US suddenly these two superpowers realized that they needed a third actor in the system in order to prevent a major international global clash from arising. And it was in this situation that they decided to have China re-enter the world. And uh, I think uh, from my perspective, Russia is the only country today uh, among those great powers that would greatly benefit from the uh, sort of idea of establishing a triangular world order. And um, I think that from my short historical overview, uh, one could maybe understand that in situation when things get really, really tough and really uh, dangerous, uh, maybe to find a third actor in the system would be the best solution. Thank you very much. Susanna, thank you very much. Uh, there was another 10 minutes uh, full with uh, information. And, um, and we can now move to uh, the discussions. Thanks a lot to all uh, contributors, to all speakers, that you really kept your, your time limit wonderfully, as uh, so we do have enough uh, time uh, for discussion. And um, and uh, let me reiterate, so there are two ways to contribute to the discussion. Number one is if you uh, listen to us on Zoom, uh, then please do the, the virtual uh, raising the hand. Uh, and number two, if you tune in via Facebook, then uh, please uh, write a comment and the comment is going to be forwarded to me. So um, then I'm going to start now with, um, with questions 
from uh, from the Zoom crowd, so to say, uh, if there are any already. Okay, Franz Xaver, you're gonna go first. Um, thank you. First of all, uh, I thank the three of you for this very insightful presentations. Um, my question is based on um, the book Legitimacy in International Society by Ian Clark from 2005, where he elaborates four constituents for international legitimacy. Um, and one of those constituents is uh, the category of rightful membership. Um, just to explain this in very short words, um, Clark has seen a preference on the international stage for liberal democracies. Um, and being a liberal democracy is kind of a precondition to enjoy all rights and duties uh, in the international system. So my question is, if the liberal state order further declines, what could we expect uh, a new rightful member to look like? So what might be the preconditions in future to enjoy all duties and rights in the international system? Thank you. I'm going to bundle questions a bit, if, that, if, that's, if that's okay. Um, if there's for the time being, I don't see anything from the, from, the, from the Zoom people. Let me move over. No, there is. Susanna, please. Yeah, thank you for your very interesting um, presentation. Um, I would have a question about the triangle. Uh, how would the triangle shift if the tensions in Taiwan would get worse? Um, and would this even have an effect on Russia? I mean, the effect on, on the US is more or less clear, but would this also do something for Russia? Thank you. Um, and I'm going to go on. I think I'm going to bundle always five because I see a lot of questions coming. Apologize, <laughs> apologies to the, to the presenters. Then, uh, Professor Isaac, Hubert, I think you have your hand up. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, my cam has been deactivated by the host. Um, so my, my, my oh, question goes please to... reactivate the cam. <laughs> okay. <laughs> my question uh, goes to uh, Reinhard Heinrich, and I'm very glad to see him again, at least some 15 years after we met in Pittsburgh. Um, and you will not be surprised that my question uh, addresses the US-European-EU relationship. Um, so my point is, uh, will there really be uh, some kind of a substantial change now uh, back to a more, let's say, harmonious um, development of world, of, of how the two uh, powers, the two continents would look at, at the world order? Um, and on the other hand, uh, I would like to raise again a point which you made, and you referred to the different positions of the, of the two big parties. The question is, uh, why at all should the United States engage more with the European Union? Because wherever in the world they try to enforce their ideas, their policies, um, the European Union is not really helpful for them. What do you think about this? Well, thank you very much. I should add, by the way, so that the idea to have this panel that, that started with a discussion amongst, amongst the, 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 the network members. And, uh, and Hubert was in there as well, and he talked uh, about the European Union as well. And uh, so this is actually the, the, the incentive, the, 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 the idea behind the, behind the panel today. Uba, thank you very much. And we're going to go on. I just uh, allow two more questions in the first round. Morgis, you're going to be next. Hello. Uh, good evening. Thank you very much for your insightful presentations. And uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Yeah, because we can't trust the DA internet most of the time. So I have no, to check. It. It's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, thank you very much for, for, for all the presenters. I have only a couple of questions. The first question goes to uh, Professor Hens, if, if I, I pronounce it uh, wrongly, I'm sorry. So, uh, you were saying that uh, China threatens the liberal world order. That was your conclusion, finally. And 
My question would be in what particular ways China is posing a threat to the liberal world orders? Because if you see the vast majority of the research and the finding and even policy documents shows that China is simply filling the gap which is left by the US and other world, uh, Western countries, specifically in Africa. So I, I would like you to reflect upon that. And the second question is to Professor uh, Mangot, which is, he classified the uh, Russian situation whether it is intrinsically expansionist or if he just, Russia just wants us to have a say and or, or, or a place in the existing world order. But is it possible even conceptually speaking is that a country can be intrinsically expansionist? How can a country state exist if its very existence is uh, in intrinsic, if not its foreign policy? So these are two of my questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Morgas. And then we have one more. And, uh, and I'm gonna go with Manuel. Just one more, one more thing with the, with, the, with the Zoom people, make sure to use this virtual raising the hand because otherwise for me, because uh, there are a lot of, lot of people who wanna talk and otherwise for me, it's difficult to, to identify them, especially in the order, okay? Manuel. No, thank you. Unfortunately, I couldn't find the function for digitally raise my hand. But the fact, thank, the you, function, thank you for, the function for, for, for everyone because I had to learn interesting that, contribution. Uh, <laughs> to, there's, there is, um, there's something about re reactions or reaktionen in German uh, and, and on the bottom. And then you click on that and then, and then you have certain icons and one of them is raising your hand, which is yellow. Okay, Manuel, you go. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I just had a question for Professor Heinisch. Um, how would you think that the US, especially now after Corona, will counter all this economic power of China, especially on the economic battlefield of Europe, for example, this the One Belt, One Road initiative, but also other investment initiatives. I mean, Europe now already started to go a little bit against it, where initially they were kind of happy that this money was came in. But how will especially Biden will try to counter this dynamic? Manuel, thank you. And uh, finally, let me give the word uh, to the presenters again. Uh, and we can probably just go in the order in which they present the maybe the easiest one. Then Reinhard, you would go first, please. Great, thank you. Great questions. Um, I, um, I'm going to tackle some of them. I thought they were directed my way and then and, and leave some of the others. Um, maybe perhaps in the reverse order, uh, Biden, um, Corona. Um, if you look at um, the current discussion in the US, Biden is trying to pass a massive, massive infrastructure bill. And uh, when you also saw the attack on the US pipeline and uh, the, the hacker attack of some from Russian hackers, a, a few, a few um, well, the Americans claim at least um, uh, last week, Biden is gonna use this to sell his infrastructure package. So in other words, the, the, the Biden administration is, is saying um, we need to do infrastructure. We need to do a lot more domestically. He's firmly of that camp that the United States needs to get its houses or in its house in order. And the challenge posed by, posed by China is something that that the Democrats are using um, to pass uh, legislation and to push that push that 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 point. Um, certainly, the the the, the post-corona world um, will be the major, I think the major challenge economically. We, we still don't know the US has um, negative disappointing jobs numbers coming out and their early hints of inflation. It's not clear whether that is uh, an aberration or a temporary, or we're seeing a bigger story that we have inflation going up, creeping up and, um, and, and sagging growth. And, and if that's the case, I think Biden is dead on the water. I think he will not be able to, to move out of this. If this is temporary and the US will recover um, and, and, and it, it, then this is less of a problem. The United States is overall not so concerned about the One Belt, One Road initiative. There's still sort of a narrative that, um, you know, the, the, the China talks about this a lot, but, but this has not been an unmitigated blessing for the countries that have taken these loans and, and China and, and a lot of these countries are, have sort of 
having second thoughts about this. There was a recent study that was published on uh, Chinese lending policies because they, they analyzed over 100 lending contracts. And if you get these Chinese contracts, uh, you know, you, you, then you as the, the recipient, the loan recipient, um, have actually uh, not an easy time. So, so uh, Biden is less concerned about that. And, and Biden is also um, clear that the US wouldn't be able to offer something um, to these countries along the same lines. Um, I, th I think that is a the, the discussion is, is it, that's a different discussion in the US. And I think the discussion on infrastructure and, and, and post COVID economy is much more what will the, what kind of economic policies will countries will countries uh, undertake. Um, Mogan's question about um, the, the, the China threat in the world order. First, I did not say that China threat is the world order. I'm saying that was the perception of, uh, of, of, of actors in the United States. And it's not so much, my argument was not so much that China is threat, threat in the world order, but the argument was the existing world order is based on certain premises. Um, and these premises have not really been called into questions. Um, and we've all pretended the premises are still there. But nowadays we see that these premises, these American promises to defend certain countries, to the stand by alliances, these um, are being called into question, not only by the antagonists of the United States, but also by the United States itself. And when the United States no longer even pretends to defend its, 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 its promises or the claims that it will stand by its own promises, it is clear that the others, the enemies of the United States, or those who don't like the American-based uh, American world order or uh, the American alliance system will certainly say, well, you know, the US itself is making that claim. It's not just us saying that, it's not just propaganda, the US itself isn't really serious about it. So I think what threatens the world order or whatever threatens status quo is the United States actually arguing that it may no longer be, be, be responding to this. Moving on to the question on uh, the UN, U European Union and the United States, I think that is absolutely correct. I mean, as a, a Chinese um, um, scholar, as a, as a, as a Chinese uh, foreign policy specialist, always sort of points out in, in meetings that the European Union has two, uh, has a, a terrible combination that it is rich and weak and, and the world loves um, uh, rich, the combination of, of, of being rich and being weak. And so the United States um, is, is, the Europe is seen sometimes by the US um, as a liability. And I think the, 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 the American right increasingly sees uh, the EU as, as a liability and sees the EU as a problem because it sees the, EU, the EU as representing for the most part as an institution, less in the form of certain member states, is it embodying the, the Democratic Party? There's an inherent closeness between the, the, the values and the way they, the thinking of the Democratic Party and sort of what you get from Brussels and what you get from, from, from think tanks and from some of the, the leading countries in the European Union. And, and, and that partisanness of Europe uh, writ large is, is, I think, a problem in European American relations. And it is a problem in European American relations to the extent if we have in the future an oscillation of the US between a Trumpian Republican Party and a, an anti-Trumpian uh, Democratic Party. And, and it's quite clear that if these two trends prevail, um, either the two parties will certainly make a comeback. I mean, it's not going to be that one party will always be in power. And that is a real problem for Europe because Europe sort of seems to be uh, the spitting image of, of one of the two parties in the United States. And I think that is a structural, a structural issue. Now, Trump has tried to sort of point and maybe build up another Europe um, sort of in represented, represented by the, 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 the sort of the, the um, the less liberal internationalist part, um, the, the Orbans and others. But I think it, 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 Trump didn't succeed, didn't get very far with this. But I think that is the fundamental issue. Um, Europe and United States, um, the, this, this sort of connection between um, Europe and, and a divided America on that. Um, on top of that now, um, the United States is certainly 
will probably scale back its commitment to Europe, particularly if the Europeans are leaving Biden in the lurch. I think there is a there the, the Biden was very much present as the Europeans uh, gave Obama the Nobel Prize. Uh, were happy that Obama was elected. Obama came to Europe was he was hailed as a hero, but the Europeans didn't really contribute and didn't really also contribute to 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 NATO and to, to the extent that Obama had wanted. And and therefore uh, Biden is going to look for actual substantive European contributions. Nonetheless, the Europeans do serve a useful purpose uh, for the Americans, uh, and even the Bush administration, the, the, uh, the, the Bush too, had to come to the begrudging realization that in the end you need um, other rich countries with capacity to bring in um, resources and, and, and police and others that, that can help you. So they, they play a useful role, but it's a useful role in a, in a limited context. But the, Europe, the Americans are increasingly less willing to bail out the Europeans, and they want the Europeans to pull their own weight. And I think that is very much also something the Biden administration will enforce. If the Europeans don't act, the Biden administration will probably move on. So I think in that sense, there will be a lot of pleasantries and it will look good, but it's, it's in the substance, I think, that, that will not be very substantive, that, that uh, alliance in the future if the Europeans don't meaningfully contribute to that. But if the Europeans want to, that's a European decision. I mean, the Europeans do not have to play by the American fiddle. They just have to think through the alternatives and then uh, make a decision. And I think I'll leave that and, and um, um, uh, leave it to, uh, to the others to talk about some of the other, the other questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Reinhardt. And then I'm going to hand the word over to you, Gao. Well, I want to answer the two questions directed at me. First, the consequences of a clash between China and the United States for Russia and its foreign policy. And the other question was on whether Russia is intrinsically expansionist and my attitude towards it, if I got question right. Well, uh, to the first question, I'd say that uh, Russia is quite interested in having a, 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 a deeper confrontation between China and the United States including a military confrontation, be it over Taiwan or something else. Because according to the Russian perspective, this would elevate its relevance for both the United States and the People's Republic of China. Well, if there is a full confrontation between the two actors, then those voices in the United States may become louder who say, we need to disentangle Russia and China, this alliance between the two, and uh, get Russia into the Western camp. Like scholars like uh, John Mearsheimer, for instance, argue that way, or Doug Bendel argues in that way, whereas others like Matthew Kroger, for instance, argues that the United States will be uh, capable of balancing both China and Russia. But uh, in the Russian foreign policy circles, there is a camp which says, well, if there's a confrontation between the US and China, then the United States may, uh, may need us more than they do at the current moment. And that will be the opening for a new alignment between Russia and the United States. But there's also another camp in the Russian foreign policy circles who argue if there is a clash between the two, uh, very much if it's a military clash, the uh, symmetry in the cooperation between Russia and China will be re-established. Because currently the Russians, uh, of course, recognize that they are the junior partner in this sort of entente, or however you call it, between Russia and China for various reasons. And uh, if uh, China would need Russia more because of a confrontation with the United States, this symmetry would be reestablished uh, as Russia would like to see it reestablished. And I, I didn't, I'm not a Chinese specialist, but I think also uh, China wants to treat Russia fairly and kindly because uh, for the Chinese, uh, there is this threat that Russia, Russia might turn to the Western camp and ally with the Western camp against China. And so uh, the Chinese need to keep the Russians close to them in order to prevent them from being a swing state. And as far as uh, this intrinsically expansion, intrinsical expansionism is concerned, well, very much those scholars who see Russia as an imperialist or neo-imperialist country 
uh, use this argument. Uh, they say expansionism has been a, character a characteristic feature of both uh, Tsarist Russia when the mm -hmm. Russian foreign policy started in the mid of the 15th century with even the third and the establishment of third Rome. And they argued that expansionism was also a characteristic feature of Soviet foreign policy. And uh, this argument that Russia in this tradition of both the Tsarist Empire and the Soviet Union, uh, uh, those who say that Russia is uh, intrinsically expansionist are also those who have championed NATO enlargement in the 1990s and the early 2000s, and uh, still consider that to have been a very good and wise decision as I don't see it. I personally don't think that Russia is a neo-imperialist or an imperialist country. I don't think it's intrinsically expansionist. So I don't think that we need containment and deterrence in dealing with Russia, but I think that Russia uh, is open to accommodation of Russian and Western vital interests. But as far as I see, the majority of those, of the scholars on Russia is in the camp uh, arguing for containment and deterrence and in the political field, as far as political actors are concerned, I also see that the, the, the bigger camp is the camp which sets not on accommodation, but on containment and deterrence. Yeah, thank you very much. And that's the time you have the word. Yeah, I will um, say something about the um, Taiwan Triangle issue. Uh, I think this is a very interesting one, and I was very interested to hear what Professor Mangold had to say about this. Um, uh, I think from a historical perspective, we know that during the Khrushchev era, uh, China actually tried to what they call liberate Taiwan and made preparations for militarily liberating Taiwan twice. And in both cases, it was the Russian side that actually prevented China from, from going into this uh, war. So uh, it is quite interesting to see that, uh, especially uh, since the Cold War archives uh, have been opened and we can look into more, more sources on this, we, we understand the situation um, much clearer than in the past. When you read um, the academic literature on the Taiwan issue during the 1950s and 60s, you will usually read this as a Sino-US uh, thing, but um, as a consequence of the Cold War um, research we've been doing in, in the last um, 10 to 20 years, we know that Russia played a major role. So the Taiwan issue can be a triangle issue also in the sense that Russia might play a role. And um, I think there are possibilities, uh, both possibilities, as we just heard. You know, uh, sometimes I think uh, Chinese um, people in foreign policy are a little bit uh, reluctant to go to come too close to Russia because they think that Russia is too outspoken in actually challenging the world order. But as China is now turning towards wolf warrior diplomacy. And um, they actually somehow sometimes think that China, that Russia is holding them back. Uh, so there seem to be two possibilities. And uh, I think the really interesting uh, thing we, we, we will have to sort of be aware of is that, you know, if Joe Biden says that uh, both China and uh, Russia are potentially adversaries of the US, then I think he puts the US and the world into a very awkward situation. Because I don't think that we have ever been able to see in history one country fighting against two enemies simultaneously and winning the war. Okay, so uh, this is one aspect of this problem. The other aspect of this problem is, you know, just think, uh, we go on isolating Russia and we go on dividing the world into two camps, then Russia will end up being an ally of China because the two countries actually complement each other in many, many aspects. <clears throat> and I think <clears throat> the military uh, potential of China will grow enormously if they start actually coordinating their military efforts. And this is something which will not be very easy to handle from the US side, even if 
you know, the US alliance is going to be a, quite a big alliance. So uh, from this point of view, I think, you know, um, uh, we should be very, very careful in pushing Russia uh, into marginality, you know, uh, giving more and more sanctions and everything so that Russia ends up having to closely cooperate with China, even though uh, it doesn't like its junior partner role in the connection with China at this point. And I think the moment the military question will become even more urgent than it is at the moment, then the Chinese side will have to realize that it needs the military support of Russia. And, and I totally agree that this would be a situation when, uh, when China and, 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 and Russia will actually unite because of the need of uniting and uh, because it's a pragmatic reason to do this. It's a pragmatic um, way of solving the problem. It's not you know, like ideological or something like it might've been in the past. I just wanted to say one or two words about the, the question whether or not China is just filling the gap that the US leaves open. Well, I totally agree that China is filling the gap, but I don't agree to the wording of saying it is just filling the gap because the way China is positioning itself in the world as a major power is by filling the gap that is being left, uh, left open by, by the United States. So it's not just, you know, it's, it's a clear strategy here from the, the Chinese side that, you know, wherever you have the opportunity of filling a gap, whatever gap it is, sometimes the EU, for example, in the southern part of Europe also leaves lots and lots of gaps for China to jump in and actually sort of come with direct investments and Belt and Road initiatives in order to, to actually position itself as a major power in Europe. The problem here is that China has never done this before in the past. And for example, the so-called uh, debt trap and all these kind of things, um, from my personal point of view, is a sign of something really, really dangerous. And this danger, uh, danger stems from the fact that there are people in China who don't know how to handle China's new position in the world. This is really, really dangerous. And secondly, that um, the, the fact that they don't know how to handle this situation, but nevertheless tend to actually what Mao Zedong once said in the part, they, they, they actually you know, have enemies all over the world, not only you know, very defined one or twos, but they're actually creating enemies all over the world. Well, the fact that they actually doing this is due to the fact that they have a perception of themselves, which is not in accordance with the real strength that the country has developed during the last decade. And why does it have this wrong self-perception of its own strength? It is because of COVID. It is because of COVID. It sees all these other countries handling the COVID situation with such difficulty that they perceive of themselves as the only country that actually knows how to deal with difficult situations. And this Self-perception leads to an overestimation of its own strength. And I think this is extremely dangerous for China and for the world. And this is what we have to really tackle, uh, you know, within the next weeks to come, I would say. Susan, thank you very much. Uh, then we're going to do one more round with the Zoom audience and then uh, another round with the, the Facebook audience. And, uh, and now you've all uh, raised the electronic hand wonderfully, so I'm simply going to go down that list. Then uh, Hannah, you're going to go first. Uh, yes, thank you very much to all of you for taking the time to discuss with us. Uh, my question would be for Professor Weigrin Schwiegeritz. Uh, Schwiegeritz, sorry. sorry. Um, you talked quite a bit about polarity and I found that quite interesting. 
uh, especially because I recently reread this piece by um, Randall Schreller, who's already been mentioned by uh, Pro uh, Professor Mangott and two other authors. Uh, who argue that maybe at this point it's uh, more useful to speak of non-polarity since power, power cannot be easily um, projected anymore in a constructive way. You can disrupt, you can harass, but maybe you can't really do anything constructive anymore with your power. And so uh, he argues that maybe we should transition to this notion of non-polarity. Um, how uh, would you react to that, especially with your knowledge of China? Thank you. Thank you, Hanna. Then uh, next one is Julia, please. You have to unmute, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Uh, I have a question to Professor Heinisch. Um, given China's increasingly aggressive attitude uh, towards Taiwan, um, if, uh, if China goes to war against Taiwan to win it back, do you think that the United States will come to Taiwan's rescue? And um, then to Professor Mangot, given uh, like given that Professor Wagen Schutzig said that in the past uh, Russia had or the Soviet Union um, had kind of um, uh, like kept China from uh, winning back. Uh, Taiwan, do you think that Russia would uh, would help the United States uh, or uh, or would keep uh, China from going to war against Taiwan? Thank you. Thank you. And uh, then uh, next on my list is Nathaniel. Uh, yes. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi. Perfect. Well, thank thank you so much for the very interesting. Uh, discussion and topics. I had a quick question for uh, Professor uh, Heinisch first. Um, so a political scientist, uh, Adrian Pabst in his book, uh, Liberal World Order and its Critics, discusses how essentially the modern liberal order has kind of fallen apart in respect to situations such as uh, the rise of Trump, uh, Brexit and disruptive states such as um, Russia and even China. And firmly uh, grounds his belief in the reestablishment of such order through pushing fundamental core moral values, moral hegemony, and uh, cooperation. Now, my question is, um, as you mentioned before, there's a possibility for some a condition of like the United States to swing back from a Biden administration to a situation very similar to Trump's. Um, how can we consolidate a reestablishment of a new liberal world order? Um, that might be predicated upon such moral hegemony when the strong powers they themselves are not necessarily even uh, decided on such values in the first place and they might swing from section to section. And then in the same vein for Professor um, Susanna, apologies, I don't wanna okay, butcher no your last name. No <laughs> uh, so what do you, uh, so what will the social contract of China look like uh, beyond the medium to short term future. So I guess it would probably be hard to sustain the level of, of authoritarianism um, that China currently displays. But on the other hand, I think it might be hard to picture China embracing the democ democratic values and democracy in a Western sense. And so how would that kind of how would that play out per se? Thank you. Thank you very much. And the next question is by Akhil. Akhil. Uh, hello. Thank you very much. Um, I would just like to ask Mr. Mangot, um, considering that he mentioned during the presentation that the, the perceptions matter, um, I want to ask what substantial steps can be taken from the European side in order to bring the, uh, the Russian interests in line with those of the EU, uh, especially concerning the, the, the fact that um, uh, Russia uh, Russia's interests include a change of norms of international order and is very much against the, the normative aspects of the EU's agenda. So what, what would be would be realistic to uh, make up for the exclusion of Russia in the past and the, the crisis we're facing today? And what would substantial steps in terms of would a more common uh, foreign policy approach to CIS or um, 
uh, or a more cooperative uh, approach to combating terrorism uh, would be it would be adequate. Thank you. Thank you, Atil. And then there's one more question of Vandas Paklevis, please. Thank you so much for your insightful uh, presentations and uh, in, from the very high level of the international uh, changes. And I have two quick questions. Uh, the first one is uh, to the Professor Mangot, and you mentioned about the Russian perspective and uh, uh, especially uh, on this uh, concert of great powers as one of the solutions. And I, I just uh, want to ask uh, from the Russian perspective, uh, is this uh, solution something which replace UN or current uh, multilateral framework or something which will be built in in uh, current multilateral framework or maybe just something to reform. So what does it look like? I want to know a bit more about this uh, concert of great power concept. And the second question is to you all. And uh, we discuss about the tri tripolar, uh, uh, tri trilangular polarity, but uh, for example, there are some sub or secondary uh, power layers like in Europe or Japan or uh, maybe India in future. So what kind of countries will be in this potential next polarity and uh, what will their role look like in the future? Thank you so much. These are my two questions. Thank you very much for your questions. And I'm going to hand the word over again to our presenters. Uh, so Reinhard, you can go first again. Thank you again for the questions. Great questions. I'm, I'm going to try to talk about the three questions that were directed to me, to all, of, to all of us. Let me perhaps restart out by reiterating there is a fundamental difference between the United States and the other two players. Um, for the United States, the world is a backdrop to domestic issues. I don't think, I mean, I know in China there, there, there are different schools of thought on, 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 on China's role in the international world order, but these are academic debates. Xi Jinping does not have to look at polls and I mean, he has to, he has to, you know, heed certain tendencies, but nonetheless, um, the United States um, is in a situation where we have domestic politics and domestic considerations driving foreign policy. Um, and so it matters greatly um, um, for an American president and for the political parties um, um, so, um, what have, how popular these things are. So in other words, um, um, someone like Biden, for example, who was continually accused by the Republicans that he's sort of in China's hand, he's soft peddling on China. And when Biden becomes president, he will sort of give away the family silver to the Chinese. Biden has to act forcefully. Obama was constantly criticized for being weak, uh, for soft peddling. When Obama was, when he first came in, he was he, he very, he, he bowed down in front of the Saudi king and there was a campaign that shows how subservient the Democrats are. They're not acting strong, they're not manly. The, 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 there, there are many subtexts. So for an American president, it is fundamentally important that um, this is seen um, how it is it seen domestically? So there's a, a very, very important domestic uh, context and in a very polarized society with very, very tight margins with elections coming on again next year, the domestic side is at least as important as the international side. And I think Biden is very deftly trying to project strength without being unreasonable. I think he's done the, that with respect to Russia and China. So when he, when, when he, when in the state visit with, with um, the Japanese prime minister, Biden sort of said, we will defend Japan, of course, and that earned him stern criticism from the, the Chinese media. But at the same time, he was also pragmatic and, and, and said, well, we could work with China and invited China to the, the Green Summit. And something very similar happened with, with, with Russia, sort of there was the, the sort of rebuke of Russia and Putin could be a killer, but at the same time, there was the offer of let's have a meeting and that would elevate Putin uh, to sort of, you know, an equal, to an equal, on the stage to an, to an equal state. And, and I think that was symbolically very important to Putin and sort of, I, I think this shows that Biden is trying to do these things, but there is a domestic audience that is probably more, that's certainly more important in the US than it is in these other two um, countries, powers, and because of the current US situation, that is probably the more important part. And, and Biden has to, has to be very, very careful. 
that he's not seen as being a pushover. He's not perceived as another Obama. And, but he doesn't overplay his hand either. So I think that is that needs to be understood. The question on um, Taiwan, well, I mean, I, I don't have a crystal ball. My assumption is that the U.S. would not go to war. It would not be, uh, would not be uh, intervening to defend Taiwan the way it did this um, uh, before, or sending an aircraft carrier into the Straits of Taiwan. A, the U.S. probably no longer has the capability the, the, um, to, to the, the Chinese Navy and the, the, the Chinese missiles are quite capable of probably pushing um, the, US, uh, the U.S. fleet uh, out, uh, out of the, the area. But the U.S. could very well uh, take other military options, sort of blockade the U.S. Um, China depends heavily on exports and imports, and the Chinese Navy is not in a does not have the capacity, the, the same blue water capacity as the United States has, and um, the, the Chinese, the United States could certainly cut off China from, from, from resources or could make resource importation very expensive and could severely cripple the US economy. And I think um, China would probably have to think about it twice. So, the, so there's not just the option of you know, moving in with the military to defend Taiwan or not doing anything. I think there are options in between. And as a global power with fungibility, the US um, has the ability to move this um, from one area to another. Uh, on the question of tripolarity and, and sort of the, 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 what happens with the secondary powers and, and, and um, recruitment, um, I think both countries, China and the US, are in the process of trying to gobble up to recruit um, allies and consolidate alliances and, 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 and make sure that the, uh, and, and, and I think, especially from the Biden administration side and the criticism of the Trump administration was, was always that the Republicans and Trump hadn't really taken care of the allies. So the Biden administration sees very much as is a competition of alliances and who has more allies and that the, the Trump dropped the ball on this and, and kind of, um, and did not engage with the allies. And I think that is why Biden has many defenses. Um, in terms of sort of how, how to consult, the, the, the question was also about the, the moral hegemony and how the US could claim that moral hegemony or, or moral could re reclaim that, that sort of moral role. I don't think it can. I think we're in a situation where we have at the moment two very different parties with very different outlooks, very different ideas about America, very different ideas about the role of the US in the world. And I think we will see this oscillation and I don't think there is any way this will, um, will end quickly. I, I don't see that. I mean, Biden is not gonna. He's not a young man who's, you know, we, we're gonna see uh, uh, creating a, a dynasty of Bidens and Bidens alike. The Dem Biden is an aberration, even within the Democratic Party. If you take Biden out, you have a very different Democratic Party, and you have a very different Republican Party. And in in either of these two parties, I do not see an easy extension of what we're currently seeing. And in many ways, Biden was the only person who was able to, to win against Trump because he's so different from everyone else. But that uniqueness, that difference also means there is the time will run out on this, on this model and something else that's probably different from now will, have, will take its place and replace it. Aina, thank you very much. Um, yeah. Well, I, I would not argue that Russia is eager to see a military confrontation between the United States and uh, China over Taiwan. And certainly Russia has realized that uh, for Xi, the issue of reunification is a, is a pressing issue. And it also has, has uh, taken note of the fact that she quite often no longer speaks about the peaceful reunification, but just the reunification. But the, uh, the, the, the overwhelming attitude towards this uh, Ch one China problem uh, by the Russian security and foreign policy establishment is that the United States is actually provoking or has been provoking the Chinese over the past years with uh, arms sales, which will continue under Biden, with the Taiwan Travel Act uh, um, adopted during the Trump administration, and by signals of the Biden administration that it is going to uh, drop this strategic ambiguity that has characterized uh, the US position on Taiwan 
for the past 40 years towards including Taiwan into the, into the defense perimeter of the United States in, in East Asia. So uh, no interest in a clash, but on the other hand, if there is a clash over Taiwan and the Russians do not expect to be harmed by that, but to profit from that, as I said in an earlier answer to an earlier uh, question. Well, when Russia speaks, and that's really the best case development from seen from the Russian uh, political and military establishment, if, if Russia speaks of a concert of power, it does not mean to replace the United Nations, but it wants to reinvigorate the relevance of the P5, not so much the United Kingdom and France, but very much Russia, the United States and, uh, and China. It wants to reinvigorate uh, the cooperation between these powers and have them a decisive say in solving regional conflicts and solving issues they have among themselves. So no, uh, 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 no uh, interest in replacing the system of the United Nations from which Russia with its permanent seat and the veto power profits very much, but uh, uh, going back to the early days of the United Nations as a great power uh, uh, concept, of, uh, concept that uh, the uh, permanent members have established in 1945. Well, um, when Russia argues for accommodation of interests, it very much thinks that Russia should be treated as an equal partner, despite the fact that it's a unidimensional uh, major power, a unidimensional, namely primarily a military great power. And this is linked to what I've said just before, this idea of a concert of great powers. But the major interest of, uh, of the Russian foreign policy establishment at the moment is bringing a halt to the expansion of the European Union and NATO. So what Russia considers as an essential element of an accommodation between the West and Russia is an explicit declaration by uh, NATO uh, and its uh, hegemon, the United States, that they will not look for further expansion of uh, NATO into uh, post-Soviet territory. Of course, uh, Russia is expecting that NATO uh, does not explicitly take back its promise from the Bucharest summit in 2008 that Ukraine and Georgia will become members. Russia understands that such an explicit uh, um, uh, turnaround is not acceptable to NATO, but it wants reassurances, informal, and behind the scenes that uh, Ukraine and Georgia and other post-Soviet countries will remain outside the Western military alliance. Yeah, thank you very much, Susanne. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, let's start with the uh, idea of multipolarity, non-polarity, and uh, how could China actually deal with this situation? Um, from my personal point of view, if I look at this as a historian, I have problems in trying to imagine that any decision maker in China could uh, sort of envision a world without a center periphery structure. So uh, actually from times that go back, you know, several thousand years, China has always organized territory in terms of center and periphery. And it has uh, um, perceived of itself as being the center of the world, even though um, the em emperors of the time knew very well that they only ruled part of this big world. But nevertheless, they still thought about the world in, in terms of China being the center and the rest of the world being the periphery or China being the center of the tributary system and the tributary states in the vicinity of China sort of being its immediate uh, sort of vicinity and its immediate periphery. So from that point of view, I don't think that China could imagine a world to have no structure other than a center periphery structure, but it doesn't need to be a center periphery structure in the sense that there is only one center and one periphery. And it's very interesting that if we go back to a for example, the 1940s that the Japanese empire at the time already developed the idea of a multipolar world and, and exactly sort of 
came up with the idea that every pole or every region of the world needed to have a center and a periphery. So from this point of view, I think that, um, you know, China could maybe accept a multipolar system, but at this particular moment, I think that they actually perceive of the world as already going beyond this development stage where um, sort of several poles would compete with each other um, with the aim of finally defining those countries in the world that take over responsibility for the world at large. And uh, at this moment, as I said earlier, they think that China and the US are actually the two countries. And, and, and they try to do this in a peaceful way. So they try to convince uh, the US that, you know, it should share responsibility for the world with China. Uh, actually, also very interestingly, something that Japan during the 1920s was actually striving for. Uh, Japan was very compliant in the 1920s, it actually co collaborated very nicely with the US, and it, it actually thought that uh, there is a way for uh, Japan to take over responsibility for Asia and for, for Russia, uh, for the US to take uh, uh, over responsibility for the rest of the world. So, so uh, from an Asian perspective, this seems to be a very sort of natural development, and it uh, sort of coincides with um, the self-perception of China as a, a major country in this world. But with regard to the internal situation in China, which I have so far not talked about, uh, I think it would be um, very, very dangerous to think that Mr. Xi Jinping actually does not have to cater to the needs of certain factions in his party, and that he actually also has to um, be aware of a, a strongly growing nationalism in China, which again is the result of uh, enormous uh, economic uh, problems that China is facing and that most of the journalists who report about Chinese economic successes um, don't really talk about. But uh, the situation in China is in some respects um, very precarious because the inequalities in society, in the economy, are enormous. Uh, what Xi Jinping is actually doing at this point is something that everybody might think is quite uh, unexpected. He is actually um, closing the private economy sector of its econ of China's economy. He is pushing into more and more state control for the economy. It is actually something that we know that did not work out in China that he is doing now. And why does he do this? Um, I'm afraid to say that he has two reasons to do this. On the one hand side, he is catering to the need of the Maoist, new Maoist faction uh, inside the party, a faction that has been growing enormously over the last years. And uh, it is this faction that is actually sort of designing the way back into a planned economy that he, is, he has been taking during the last two or three years. And the other reason why he is doing this is be because he's preparing for war. And he is actually doing, he is actually building his, his economy in a way that the, the, the state can take over um, the economy in order to be able uh, to uh, act in a warlike situation. And I'm not saying that I think that he is preparing for war in the sense that he wants to, to, to uh, be, take the first step in, in launching a war. I don't think that this would be his idea because China always waits for someone else to begin a war before they get started. And I don't think that he would be uh, an exception from this rule. But they are expecting war and he is preparing the economy for war. And that is the, yet another reason that he is sort of really, really running down the private uh, sector in China's economy, despite the fact that we ha have observed over the last three to four decades that the uh, private economy is actually the economy that has driven China to the point where it is now. It's not the state economy. And uh, I think this is uh, something we will have to have in mind. And, and so, uh, although this system is not democratic, it is a system that is um, 
uh, responsive to all different kinds of internal policy issues. And one of the reasons why Mr. Xi Jinping is preparing for war is because his situation inside China is very precarious. And thanks a lot. Um, we're going to do one more round of uh, questions, and that's going to be now uh, from the Facebook site. Um, for the most part, I'll simply summarize the questions. In two cases, I'm going to read them out aloud. Um, first question by Christoph Feyner. Uh, is India a potential ally for the United States? Second question also by Christoph Feyner, this one I'll read to you. Did Russia's change of internal policy towards the economy since 2000 hurt its abilities to gain independence from technical capabilities, in brackets, for example, the technical ability to drill for oil solely with Russian firms from the uh, West? Uh, excuse me, can you please uh, uh, raise the question again? I didn't get it. Yeah, I'll try. I'll try again. I'm reading it because it doesn't. Uh, the, 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 it's, it's a bit ambivalent. So, did Russia's change of internal policy towards the economy since 2000 hurt its abilities to gain independence from technical capabilities from the West? And examples given for these technical capabilities is technical ability to drill for oil solely with Russian firms. It's okay, yeah. Then um, next question is, is uh, it's straightforward. Can the, can the European Union influence Russian interests? Um, next question also straightforward. Uh, do EU sanctions against Russia work? So uh, there's quite a bit for you there. Um, and then there is um, one more question that I'm also going to read aloud, a bit longer as well. Um, considering the debates about a maritime warfare in the Pacific, could you comment about how the new American administration is structuring its relations in the Indo-Pacific? And then the question goes on. On the one hand, the small islands in particular are members of the non-aligned movement. What emphasizes their autonomy and agency in dealing with major power? On the other hand, China's financial policies have been singled out as serving the military purpose of building a system of alliances that would protect, protect the maritime routes to Beijing and the two other countries um, from what China perceives as encirclement policy. And, um, and then I have seen beforehand that our uh, very own Hubert Isaac had still his hand up. And I don't know, Hubert, I don't know whether you're still around. If you are, then you will have the privilege to ask the very last question of the day. But I think he may have given up on us. <laughs> so that's fine, but we have enough questions anyway. So that's the very, very last round. And um, and dear presenters, feel free also to, to uh, so, so answering the questions and also uh, perhaps conclude your remarks very, very uh, quickly. Um, Reinhardt again. Thank you very much. Um, okay, um, let me just also um, just go back to something that was said earlier um, first. Um, it is quite clear that there are enormous domestic pressures. Anyone who spends any time in China realizes the, the complexity of the domestic situation, the generational change, the economic pressure, and the, the, um, the, 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 the different um, impacts that has on, on the leadership. I think the difference to the United States in my assessment is that First, Biden came out um, as the underdog of a race and was uh, being defined by the by the Republican Party um, as a weak and daft and 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 intellectually not very capable person. So Biden is under enormous pressure to prove uh, to prove to, to create a different image to project an image of strength. Um, secondly. Um, the, the, the division in the United States is not only a division between different 
more or less established policy approaches. Um, but we have essentially a, a situation where under Trump, we had no overall doctrine for several for China or for several parts of the world. We have with bluster and threats, we had erratic policy towards North Korea, we had coddling with strongmen, we had disrespect for institutions, with isolationist impulses, then the use of trade as a weapon, but then concessions. It was a very much a, a very um, unfiltered, a very sort of incoherent policy. And at the same time, we have in a, a, a resurgent Republican party, that could win the midterm elections and the next presidential election that is clearly isolationist and, and, and at the same time engages in China bashing and, 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 and engages in, in threatening China. So and, and, and I think it's the overall incoherence. And, and this incoherence um, often doesn't really require an external player. It doesn't require China to do something or not to do something. It's often an internal debate that is going on. And in that situation, it's exceedingly, I think Biden or the current administration is often driven by that domestic uh, power game that is unfolding. And, and, and behavior that we see um, should be explained primarily in relation to the domestic uh, power game and less in relation to um, what other actors are doing. Um, clearly, from a Biden administration, the policy to Russia, I mean, seen, Russia is seen as, I mean, we have to understand the role of Russia from, from the democratic perspective, from the Biden perspective. Russia is seen as an enabler of Trump, um, of, being, of interfering in American election, interfering in, in, in American democracy, putting a bounty on American GIs in Afghanistan, where the Americans claim Russian money, the Russian intelligence services funnel resources to, to actually assassinate American GIs. Uh, and, 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 and Trump sort of looked the other way, but it was in, in all the US intelligence assessment. At the same time, Biden is sort of being vice president in the Obama period when the, the big reset with Russia was planned and Obama took the theater defense system down, but then we had the, the, the incursion in, in Ukraine. So from, from, from the Biden perspective, that Russia is an enemy here, it, it's less an enemy of the United States. It is much more an enemy from that filter that the Democratic Party has and the democratic narrative, as I'm talking about the Democratic Party narrative about the role of Russia. The Republicans care a lot less about Russia and care a lot less about the whole notion of liberal democracy in, 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 in other parts, at least um, the Republican voters that are now in the ascendancy or the, that type of the Republican Party that's in the ascendancy. That is not the case with China. Because China is seen as a threat on different levels. And the China threat sort of resonates so strongly because it resonates in the hinterland. The narrative about globalization and, and outsourcing and the, the, the Chinese sort of uh, becoming rich and, and powerful in the wake of America spending its blood and treasure as the, the uh, quote unquote, on, on, on preserving the world order and fighting terrorism, that is something that that does resonate in the hinterland. And that is a story that is electorally important. So how a president acts on China, whether a president is seen acting strong on China has electoral consequences. It does not have the same consequences when it comes to Russia. And when it comes to Russia, it only has consequences with one of the two parties. On India, um, the United States has not had a consistent India policy. And the problem with the India policy is that on one hand, India, of course, is a democracy. Uh, the Democrats have been trying to open the US up to India. Uh, India is a potential ally in the, in, the, in the struggle with China. But the Modi government is seen as a nationalist and populist and, and, and anti and, and sort of from a Democrat, from the, the small D democratic perspective, a sort of the wrong kind of Indians with, with, with whom to, to coddle. And then there's the whole issue with Afghanistan and Pakistan. So in other words, for the US, the relationship with Pakistan was more important and because it, it was the linchpin to Afghanistan. And, and that always interfered with its India policy. But of, of course, I expect if, if, if Russia, 
and China, um, if, if, if the, the, the closeness of Russia and China would probably uh, impel the United States to, uh, to, to increase its, its, its relationship with, with, to improve its relation with India um, and, and uh, the, the exit from Afghanistan may actually make that um, uh, more likely or more possible. Thank you. Thank you, Reinhard. Yeah. Just a brief remark uh, uh, on what uh, Professor Heinisch has just said about the democratic narrative about Russia. I think uh, this narrative uh, uh, still overestimates the impact of Russian meddling in 2016 in the presidential elections in 2016 on the outcome of these elections. And the story about Russia paying Taliban fighters to kill Americans is quite absurd. Even, Russia, even US intelligence services say uh, they have only low or moderate uh, confidence in uh, in th this uh, this argument that Russia pays Taliban to kill U.S. and allied fighters. Why should the Taliban really need Russian money to go on with killing U.S. forces? I I want to ask. Well, to the question of uh, whether the uh, U.S. and uh, EU sanctions on Russia have have worked. Well, that all that of course depends on uh, what objective. Um, should have been uh, achieved with, with these sanctions. Sanctions, of course, primarily have the, uh, the objective of changing the behavior of the targeted state. And in this respect, I need to say that Western sanctions have failed. Russia has not changed its policy on Ukraine. It has not changed its policy on Syria. Uh, due to the Western sanctions. It simply has not done anything differently uh, because of, of the sanctions. Well, in the European Union, particularly in the European External Action Service, there are some people who claim that Russia would have destabilized more uh, regions of Ukraine if uh, the sanctions would not uh, have not been imposed by the European Union and the United States. But I think this is a weak argument. You don't know whether Russia really had the intention, the motivation, to go further than the Donbas in, in Ukraine. When you think about sanctions having a punishing effect, and of course, to a certain extent, sanctions have been successful. The International Monetary Fund is arguing that Russia loses between 0.2 and 0.5% of GDP growth annually because of the Western sanctions. So in this respect, the punishment has worked. The Russian economy suffers to a certain extent, not very strongly, but to a certain extent. If you think that sanctions uh, should send a signal to uh, uh, the targeted state, then of course the, e the uh, EU and US sanctions have worked as well. The EU and the US have uh, sent a message to the Russians that uh, they, uh, do not, uh, they do not uh, like the Russian behavior in Ukraine or in Syria or uh, at other places. Um, and uh, the EU has also sent a signal to other countries that they would also face sanctions if they were to follow the Russian path uh, with territorial claims on its neighbors. So uh, the signaling effect, of course, is there. Uh, this has happened, and I think this is primarily the most important effect from uh, the view of the uh, European Union and uh, the preservation of its uh, credibility. And then, of course, you, you could think of a constrainment effect of sanctions, meaning that sanctions are intended to weaken the financial and, in consequence, the military power of the targeted state. Well, uh, in the Russian case, we can say this has not happened. Yeah. Um, Russia has continued to spend uh, the same amount of money on defense, on the conventional modernization of Russia's armed forces, and the nuclear modernization, regardless of the recession that Russia faced in 2015 and 2016, and the anemic growth that Russia has seen in the years after, after that. And finally, sanctions can also have a destabilization effect, meaning um, uh, the, the country imposing sanctions is interested in uh, causing a, a, a breakup in the leadership of the targeted state between softliners who want to uh, actually address the concerns of the sanctioning state and change the behavior and those hardliners who do not want to do so. We have not seen any cleavages, any, any, any fractioning uh, uh, of the Russian elite uh, 
because of the EU sanctions. And destabilization could also mean that you drive a wedge between the population and the leadership. And this has also not happened in the Russian case, but what we have seen is a rally around the flag effect uh, in Russia for the past seven years. So overall, I'd say, uh, depending on what objective you had with the sanctions, we could speak of them being partly effective, but in most respects that I have mentioned, I think the sanctions have not been successful, which does not mean that I argue sanctions should not have been imposed. Actually, there was no other uh, option for the Western powers, as none of the Western powers, of course, had an interest in engaging with Russia militarily over Ukraine. Can the European Union influence Russia? Well, Russia doesn't see the European Union as an equal player, uh, particularly not the EU institutions. And it does not see the European Union as an independent actor, but considers it as a vassal of the United States, particularly now when both sides, the Europeans and the US, uh, uh, vow to reestablish uh, the close transatlantic partnership and reinvigorate this partnership. So for, for Russia, the European Union is not very relevant. Relevant is uh, what the United States does and what, how the relationship between Russia and the United States looks like. What the Russians uh, uh, do reject, uh, have been rejecting over the past 20 years, is this e at EU attitude of political conditionality vis-a-vis -vis Russia, meaning that the, the depth and the, 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 the scope of relations between the European Union and Russia are made dependent on the uh, implementation of democratic institutions and the rule of law in Russia. Russia has rejected this already in the 1990s under Yeltsin, but did not say it very uh, often in public. But uh, Putin also has stated in public that uh, Russia does not accept this political conditionality from the European Union. Russia, they argue, has its own traditions, its own moral standards, its own values. And the political system established in the Russian Federation follows the lines of this historic tradition, so the Russian argument, and they reject the EU's claim that Russia uh, needs to establish sort of a liberal democracy that exists in the European Union or in the United States. Yeah, thank you very much, Susan. Yeah, thank you. Maybe um, it's my turn to say something about the US policies in the Indian Ocean, because this was a question that was asked early on. And uh, I think it is very interesting to see that um, the US policy of um, organizing alliances in order to contain China um, very much follow the pattern of how China conceives of the world. So it's very interesting that uh, after World War II, actually two external centers were uh, introduced into the East Asian setting. It was the Soviet Union with um, a lot of allies in East Asia on its side and uh, the US with lots of allies on the US side. And uh, so the Cold War in East Asia was a Cold War um, that um, actually sort of existed between two countries that were only sort of um, present in an indirect way in East Asia itself. And um, now today what the US is actually doing, it is establishing itself as a center in the region and then uh, sort of arranging for its allies in uh, several layers of concentric circles uh, around the US um, presence in East Asia. So the first circle, of course, are the closest allies of the US, including Japan, including South Korea. Uh, very interestingly, the second, uh, of course, uh, uh, Australia is also in the first circle. And then in the second circle, very interestingly, we have New Zealand, uh, we have Taiwan, and we have Mongolia. Uh, which might sort of be a little bit weird to some of us because most of us won't have heard of anything about Mongolia um, for a very, very long time. So if you read into the related papers from the US State Department, they will explain to you that the second circle are sort of the uh, um, vibrant democratic countries in the region. And Taiwan is a vibrant democratic country. New, uh, New Zealand is a vibrant democratic country, according to the US uh, State Department's assessment. And interestingly, 
Mongolia is also a vibrant democracy in the region. And, and so you see, you know, that this is a very interesting sort of way for the Chinese to put themselves at the center of the region and then uh, sort of uh, draw several um, uh, circles, um, concentric circles about around the country and 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 see how they then can actually align uh, their spheres of interest. And uh, I think that it would be inappropriate to say that the US has actually not been active in uh, assembling, uh, you know, potential members of its alliances and putting it into different drawers in different uh, concentric circles, because these um, concentric uh, circles were actually drawn under the Trump administration and I think especially Mr. Pompeo uh, was very active in, in, in traveling to these different countries and in trying to convince them of um, uh, strong support for the idea of the US to contain China. And of course, India is a very, very difficult issue in this context because India has never had a very clear foreign policy. It is a country that is very much focused on its internal situation and it uh, sort of grabs opportunities in situations of crisis. Um, it is sometimes used by other countries, you know, like if you, if, if you look, for example, at the Cuba crisis and you see that during the Cuba crisis, actually the Sino-Indian uh, conflict uh, came to a military level and, you know, how the Soviet Union then uh, suddenly uh, supported the Indian side against the Chinese and things like this. So, so I think it is um, a country that has the potential because it is so big and it has such a large population. It always has sort of a potential of being raised to a level of great power if needed. Uh, however, the most important issue here is that the leadership inside the country is not really interested in uh, uh, drawing a clear profile to its uh, foreign uh, foreign policy. I think the white elephant in this discussion today, uh, and uh, Marcus, as you said, you know who is actually missing. So there, uh, Europe is obviously missing in this discussion because although, uh, as uh, Professor Mango just said, you know um, the the Russians don't really see the EU as an independent actor. Um, and the US might not be as interested in Europe as we would wish for the US to be interested in us. Um, I would say that China is extremely interested uh, in Europe and the Belt and Road um, initiative is an initiative that has many, many aspects. But one of these aspects is actually making sure that the um, trade and the flow of goods from China to Europe and from Europe to China can continue to exist, even if the US uses its blue, uh, blue water capacity to uh, cut um, the um, trade routes between uh, Asia and, and Europe. And of course, um, China is a country whose leadership um, goes for a realist version of the theory of international relations. And they definitely see that they have to prevent Europe from siding with the US uh, unilaterally and uh, going against China. So that is why China is investing a lot of money and hope and ideology into convincing um, Europe not to um, sort of just side with the US against China. Um, if the Euro, the Euro, uh, Euro, uh, if Europe sided with the US against China, then this would definitely be uh, uh, a step that uh, would bring China into a very difficult uh, situation. And um, so I think this is um, uh, something we will have to have in mind. I, I personally think that um, as China is so interested in Europe and as objectively Europe could actually play a role in all these different games we were discussing today, um, I think it would be very, very important for Europe to actually deeply think about its geopolitical position and its 
uh, potential of having an influence on this aside from just doing uh, what the US is asking your, uh, Europe to do. And um, I, I think I sure hope that um, the decision making um, uh, level in Europe and in the countries in Europe will finally come to a point where it can develop a China strategy. Susanne, thank you very, very much. Um, that uh, we've reached the end of our panel discussion. I would really, really like to thank uh, the presenters for excellent talks. You know, one of the wonderful things about the, the Zoom uh, business is that you get immediate feedback. So, so I'm going to read some, some feedback here uh, to you. Uh, so a very interesting uh, panel discussion. Then another one, great topics and excellent panelists. So although we can't applaud you now uh, properly, that is probably something like a, a virtual applause. Thank you very, very much, uh, the three of you, uh, for, ex for an excellent discussion, for very patiently answering all our questions. There were 16 overall. So many, many thanks for that. And um, many thanks to the audience uh, on Zoom, on Facebook uh, for tuning in. I uh, just want to highlight that tomorrow, as already tomorrow, again, uh, we have another UFG event. Uh, this time around, it's going to be about programming for peace. Uh, that is a talk given by Professor Robert Trappel, who is the director of the Austrian Institute for Artificial Intelligence. It's actually um, usually the debate is cyber crimes, anything artificial intelligence usually uh, associated with conflict and war. He does it the other way around and asks what it can contribute to peace. So perhaps we're going to see you tomorrow again. Thanks a lot again to our presenters uh, for today, and I wish you a nice evening. Bye-bye.